We also read from God's Word in the book of Isaiah. We'll be reading chapters 36 and into chapter 37, the beginning of verse 9. And we, we return to Isaiah um, where we have been studying, especially in our prayer services. Um, a couple Sundays ago we did look through Isaiah um, a few chapters back looking at gems of God's grace and the many chapters regarding God's judgment. We saw how he was promising his favor and promising deliverance and promising forgiveness um, for all who would come to him. And then there were two intervening chapters that I hope to read a couple passages from there during our message, but I'll be reading chapter 36, beginning in verse 1, and we return to Isaiah because it is a wonderful passage to look at the third commandment that we are studying and as we look at Lord's Day 36. We'll be reading from from the Heidelberg Catechism as well soon, as soon as I read Isaiah 36 and the beginning of 37. So here, continue to hear God's true and eternal word. Isaiah 36, verse 1. Now it came to pass in the 14th year of King Hezekiah that Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the defensed cities of Judah and took them. And the king of Assyria sent Rabshakeh from Lachish to Jerusalem unto King Hezekiah with a great army. And he stood by the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the fuller's field. Then came forth unto him Eliakim, Hilkiah's son, which was over the house, and Shebna the scribe, and Joah, Asaph's son, the recorder. And Rabshakeh said unto them, Say ye now to Hezekiah, thus saith the great king, the king of Assyria, What confidence is this wherein thou trustest? I say, sayest thou, but they are but vain words. I have counsel and strength for war. Now on whom dost thou trust that thou rebellest against me? Lo, thou trustest in the staff of this broken reed on Egypt. Whereon, if a man lean, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all that trust in him. But if thou say to me, We trust in the Lord our God, is not he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah hath taken away and said to Judah and to Jerusalem, Ye shall worship before this altar? <clears throat> now therefore give pledges, I pray thee, to my master, the king of Assyria, and I will give thee two thousand horses, if thou be able on thy part to set riders upon them. How then wilt thou turn away the face of one captain of the least of my master's servants, and put thy trust on Egypt for chariots and for horsemen? And am I now come up without the Lord against this land to destroy it? The Lord said unto me, Go up against this land and destroy it. Then said Eliakim and Shebna and Joah unto Rabshakeh, Speak, I pray thee, unto thy servants in the Syrian language, for we understand it. And speak not to us in the Jews' language, in the ears of the people that are on the wall. But Rabshakeh said, Hath my master sent me to thy master and to thee to speak these words? Hath he not sent me to the men that sit upon the wall, that they may eat their own dung and drink their own piss with you? Then Rabshakeh stood and cried with a loud voice in the Jews' language and said, Hear ye the words of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus saith the king, Let not Hezekiah deceive you. For he shall not be able to deliver you. Neither let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will surely deliver us. This city shall not be delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria. Hearken not to Hezekiah, for thus saith the king of Assyria, Make an agreement with me by a present, and come out to me, and eat ye every one of his vine, and every one of his fig tree, and drink ye every one the waters of his own cistern, 
until I come and take you away to a land like your own land and a land of corn and wine and a land of bread and vineyards. Beware lest Hezekiah persuade you, saying, The Lord will deliver us. Hath any of the gods of the nations delivered his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arphad? Where are the gods of Shepharvaim? And have they delivered Samaria out of my hand? Who are they among all the gods of these lands that have delivered their land out of my hand? That the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand. But they held their peace and answered him not a word, for the king's commandment was, saying, Answer him not. Then came Eliakim, the son of Helkiah, that was over the household, and Shebna the scribe, and Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder, to Hezekiah with their clothes rent, and told him the words of Rabshakeh. And it came to pass when King Hezekiah heard it that he rent his clothes and covered himself with sackcloth and went into the house of the Lord. And he sent Eliakim, who was over the household, and Shebna the scribe, and the elders of the priests, covered with sackcloth, unto Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos. And they said unto him, Thus saith Hezekiah, This day is a day of trouble, and of rebuke, and of blasphemy. For the children are come to the birth, and there is not strength to bring forth. It may be that the Lord thy God will hear the words of Rabshakeh, whom the king of Assyria, his master, hath sent, to reproach the living God. And will reprove the words which the Lord thy God hath heard. Wherefore, lift up thy prayer for the remnant that is left. So the servants of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah, and Isaiah said unto them, Thus shall ye say unto your master, Thus says the Lord, Be not afraid of the words that thou hast heard, wherewith the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Behold, I will send a blast upon him, and he shall hear a rumor, and return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. So Rebshekah returned, and found the king of Assyria warring against Libna, for he hath heard that he was departed from Lachish, and he heard say concerning Ter Terhaka, the king of Ethiopia, he is come forth to make war with thee. The this phrase that we have just sung from, from Psalm 44, the voice of blasphemers and scoffers I hear, the foe and avenger against me appear. This would be a psalm that Hezekiah could be singing in these very days where Rabshakeh came and said the words that we have read in Isaiah 36. Now I invite you again, if you would open God's word in Isaiah in 36 in that, in that general area. Um, you may remember that when we, when we consider those gems of God's grace in, in the midst of all those chapters of judgment, it was from chapter 13 on that messages of judgment were coming. And then you'll remember I gave that little outline. It's important to remember that chapters 28 and 29, God was speaking directly to, to Israel and telling them, rebuking them, that they were trusting the gods of the nations, the, the kings of the nations instead of the one true king. They were going to, to their neighboring nations instead of going to God to help in regards to the challenge of other nations. And then in chapters 30 and 31, God rebuked Judah for doing the very same thing. This was something that was happening in those days. And this is, this is one of the ways that you see that God's word is absolutely relevant. This is not a modern problem. This is a problem that's been in all of history where the kings of this world, the presidents, the, 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 the prime ministers, they look at the power of their country. 
if, if it cannot go against the country that is their enemy, they will try to align themselves with another powerful nation. And, and it's not to ever say that that's not a wise thing to do. Certainly it must be done. But not where you forsake the one who is most powerful. God himself. And this is what Israel was doing. They had completely rejected the Lord and they were going to the Assyrians for help. And then Judah was going to Egypt for help. And so 28 and 29, Israel is rebuked. 30 and 31, Judah is rebuked. And then remember chapters 32 and 33 and in summary, it is God saying, this is the king that you should trust. This is the one true and powerful and majestic and glorious and beautiful and even forgiving king. This king will forgive you for not having trusted him to begin with. It is God himself. He is the rightful judge. And then there's chapter 34 and 35. In our prayer service, we just looked at those two chapters. I want to take the time right now. It's very important. And as we go to chapter 36 to realize this whole context. Now understand that again, I'm, I'm reading a lot of God's word. Um, and, and we should never apologize for that. But we need to prepare ourselves for that. Because we're not used to read so much of God's word um, for a sermon. It's usually a chapter or so. But I want to read these verses, and I, and I trust you'll understand why it, it is important to be reminded of them or to be refreshed completely. If you weren't with us last prayer service, you, you didn't hear 34 and 35. But what happens in 34 and 35? God is saying, in chapter 34 especially, God is saying, this is what will happen to you if you trust men and not me. If you trust the kings of this world, be prepared for this to happen to your nation to your cities. And 34 is the picture of a desert, of a wilderness, of, of judgment. And then 35 is God saying, this is what will happen to you if you do trust in me. If you bow before the king that I'm presenting, which is myself, and then of course there is here a presenting of Christ before he even comes. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords that God sends forth to reign for him. And in 35, you have the picture of what will happen to you as a person, as a nation, as a city, if you trust the living God. And it is the picture of a garden. We have in 34 the picture of a desert. We have in 35 a picture of a garden. And this is why our theme today is the Garden of Judah. Because, beloved, this is the exciting thing, is that in chapter 36, we find Rabshakeh coming and with all those threats saying, we will destroy you, Jerusalem, if you do not come and, 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 and give up, if you don't surrender, we will come and attack. There is the danger of that turning into a, a desert. Well, Hezekiah knows what to do. He heard the sermons. Isaiah, who's been the one preaching all of this, that's why it's right here. These are Isaiah's sermon notes that we've been reading. And Hezekiah has been reading these sermon notes. This summary that I gave to you, the, the, the great judgment that will come. And if you are a person who trusts the kings of this world, you'll turn into a desert. But if you trust God as your king, you will be a garden. And this is the wonderful Reality, beloved, I, I can give it to you right now. We, we read up to that point. Hezekiah will bow to God and not to Rabshakeh and his king Sennacherib. So Judah will be a garden. That's why the theme is the garden of Judah. And beloved, this is the astonishing thing is how history attests to this. If you look at the Assyrian Empire, don't, don't get confused with the Syrian Empire, you Google the Assyrian Empire, and there will be many maps. The right map will be the one that will show. You know how they'll show in a color the whole Assyrian Empire. There's one map that it was all orange, the Assyrian Empire. And you'll see this little circle 
around the area of Israel. You go closer, that is Judah. And it's a different color. The faithful maps will show that Judah never came under the authority and the power and the oppression of the Assyrian Empire. And chapter 36 tells you why. Because Hezekiah did not bow to the kings of this earth. He bowed to God. And so Judah could have become a desert, but it didn't. It became a garden, at least for those years, for as long as they were trusting God. And so let me read in chapter 34 the, the, the desert warnings. It begins in verse 4. I'll, I'll just read a few of them, not the whole chapter, but keep these words in your mind, beloved, because this is in many ways where you see Christ in this whole context. And you'll understand why. So look at Isaiah 34, verse 4. It says, And all the host of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll, and all their hosts shall fall down. See, this is what will happen to the nation that trusts men. As the leaf falls off from the vine, and as a falling fig from the fig tree, for my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Behold, it shall come down upon Edomia and upon the people of my curse to judgment. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood. It is made fat with fatness and with the blood of lambs and of goats and the fat of the kidneys of rams. He begins to speak of, of a sacrifice taking place. And then you go to verse 8. For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompenses for the controversy of Zion. And the streams thereof shall be turned into pitch and the dust thereof into brimstone and the land thereof shall become burning pitch. See, that's a picture of a wilderness. Look at verse 12 also. They shall call the nobles therefore thereof to the kingdom, but none shall be there. And all her princes shall be nothing. And thorns shall come up in her palaces, nettles and brambles in the fortresses thereof. And it shall be a habitation of dragons and a court for owls. The wild beasts of the desert shall also meet with the wild beasts of the islands. And the satires shall cry to the, his fellow. And the screech owl also shall rest there and find for herself a place of rest." Instead of the princes and the nobles and people from the army, it's going to be all these wild animals making noises. That's the picture of the desert. And you go to many of those places until today, this is exactly what those ruins are. And walls have not been rebuilt. And of course, in many places, for archaeological reasons, they want to preserve the ruins. But for decade after decade and centuries, these, many of these nations have not recovered. We go to chapter 35, and I want to read also, beginning in verse 4, the picture of the garden. This is what will happen to the nations and to the peoples, and even individually, beloved. This is what will happen to your own soul when you bow to God and not to man. Verse 4 of chapter 35 of Isaiah. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. Even God, with a recompense, he will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be open, and the, eyes, the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out, and streams in the desert. So it's not just that there will be a garden, but the garden will come forth out of the desert. And verse 7, And the parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water, in the habitation of dragons, where each lay shall be grass with reeds and rushes. And a highway shall be there, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those, the wayfaring men, though fools shall not err therein. No lion shall be there. So boys and girls, it's not a dangerous place. The way of holiness is a safe place. There are no lions, nor any ravenous beasts. Remember, the desert will be full of them, but not this place. Shall go up there on. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. 
and the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. And they shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. So, beloved, this is how you need to understand the context. Isaiah is the one who wrote this. Isaiah was Hezekiah's pastor. And Isaiah would have proclaimed this. Hezekiah would have heard and he would have learned, okay, if I bow to man, I will be in a wilderness. I will be even a leader turning all of Judah and Jerusalem into a desert. But if I do not fear and if I bow to God alone, then all these blessings will be ours. And Sennacherib sends Hezekiah, I mean sends Rabshakeh. And Rabshakeh says those things that we heard. And so our sermon will follow these three points. The first one, the broken reed. The second one, we'll look at the living God. And then thirdly, we'll return to what we just read here, that little phrase, the way of holiness. This this garden has an avenue that takes you to it. The avenue is already a garden, but it leads you to, to a, a fulfilled and complete garden. It's called the way of holiness, this avenue. And we'll end with, with that point. But first of all, why do I call our first point the broken reed? You notice what's happening. This is Now, with everything you have in your mind, all of those chapters about judgment, and then God saying, don't bow to man, bow to the true king. Here's a desert. Here's a garden. And then what happens in what we just read? Sennacherib, he was the king of Assyria. He had already, at this very point, conquered the north. Israel was no more. They had been taken captive. Uh, what God had promised many years to the northern ki kingdom, if they would repent, they would stay fine. If they didn't repent, they would be taken captive. It happened. If you go to 2 Kings, it's just before what we just read here about Sennacherib sending um, Rabshakeh to Judah. The little passage before shows that Hosea, the last king of the north, was taken captive with all of Israel. He's already won the battle of Lachish between Assyria and Egypt. See, these kingdoms of the past are, again, just like the kingdoms of today. They want to get bigger. They want to get better. They want to subdue the nations. And, and Assyria had already talk, taken over all of Mesopotamia and then of Syria and Lebanon area. And they had gone as far as Egypt. They, they went to Egypt first because that was a more formidable force. They kind of left Judah to the side, not worried about it. Hezekiah had just bef a little bit before this given some tribute to keep them kind of quiet. And, and we're going to see the problem of him having done that. But he came and he attacked Egypt. Egypt had been a mighty empire, but now they were waning its force. And Assyria won that battle. And look what was happening to, to Judah. Judah was in the midst of all of this global anarchy. They knew they were small. But see, God had been saying, come to me, come to me. And even Hezekiah, who had been the best king to this point, in the times of, of great need of reformation. We know this thing about Hezekiah. He was an astonishingly good king. But he was also human. And he did that which, beloved, if, if we are reasonable, it's what we're tempted to do. To cave in to the ways of the world. As he saw that mighty formidable force coming from the north, taking their sister kingdom, Israel, and then taking Egypt, whom they had been hoping would come to their aid. And that was already Hezekiah's first problem. They were relying on Egypt. Hezekiah was starting to trust the kings of this world. That's why all these sermons were for him as well, for him to stop doing that. But he had caved in. And he was thinking, well, but maybe some political help would do and would be all right. Yes, but maybe he was praying less now to God. Maybe he was sending too many gifts to Egypt. And, and, and if we go to 2 Kings, we see that he did this. He, he was so scared of Assyria that he went ahead and gave um, talents and talents of gold to, of, 
to Assyria and of silver. He took the treasuries of the kings and that was in the temple and gave it to the king of Assyria. So Hezekiah was caving in. He was starting to fear man. And with this, with this battle against Egypt having been won by Assyria, Hezekiah is terrified. And you notice it, the, 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 the prophet keeps repeating, don't be afraid. Be strong. Fear not. Behold, God will come with vengeance, 35.4. But see, Hezekiah, he got scared. And he sent the tribute money. And he was trusting um, Egypt. And so this is why, why I'm taking this first point, the, the, the name, the broken reed. You see what's happening. Um, with all the preaching that Isaiah made, since Hezekiah didn't obey the word exactly as he should have, God is now sending, it's like an ironic way, he's sending his message through an enemy. Because when you listen to Rabshakeh, if you, if you didn't know the context, you would say, isn't that what Isaiah said? And look what Rabshakeh said. Lo, this is now 36, verse 6. Thou trustest in the staff of this broken reed on Egypt, whereon if a man lean, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh king of Egypt to all that trust in him. If you go back to those chapters where Judah was being told not to trust Egypt, they're precise, similarly, word, similarly precise words. But it's coming from Rebshekah. God is essence saying, since you didn't listen to me, I'll send an enemy and he will tell you the same thing, but he will tell you the same thing as a threat to you, as an enemy, not as a God and who loves you and who cares for you like me, Hezekiah. You didn't listen to me. I'm going to send you Rabshakeh. So Egypt is this broken reed. And boys and girls, here's a picture that God's word is giving to you. It's amazing to think how God designed his word for little children because there are pictures everywhere. Why is Egypt a broken reed? Well, a reed, you know, are those little things that are very thin that stay by the river. And, and, and there are many, many reeds in the Nile River. Egypt was known as a place full of reeds. It was from the reeds that they would make the papyrus. Um, that's what Egypt was so famously known for. But those reeds were not things that you would lean against. Because if you were to put your hand on, on a pile of, of those weed, uh, reeds, if one would break, it, it would still be kind of possible to be sharp enough to hurt you. So as you lean upon it, as if you're saying, I'm going to use these reeds to help me, the moment they break, they are no longer your helper. They are the ones who hurt you. And this is exactly the play in words that Reb Shek is saying. You are leaning upon Egypt. Well, Egypt will hurt you because they're gone and that will make it where we will take you. You will be an easy prey to us. Egypt is a broken reed. And beloved, isn't this the history of the world? We, we see these powerful forces, don't we? And you just wish that they would sit down and read God's word. If the presidents of today were to sit down and read God's word, they would be better people tomorrow. They would come on national TV and they would even say, I want to proclaim that I have sinned against the living God. I have thought too highly of myself and the power of my nation. And I have subdued others and taken the lives of others because of my pride, because of my arrogance. And I have joined with other powerful nations thinking that will make me powerful instead of going to God who is the only true and living King. Let us pray, beloved, that the leaders of our very world would read the Bible. Many of them have it in their shelves. Many of them are even connected with, with religious people who use this very Bible. But they're committing exactly the same errors and mistakes of the kings of all of history where they trust each other, they trust their 
arsenals, they trust their, their, their intelligentsia, they, they, they trust their finances, and not the true and living king. And meanwhile, people die, people suffer. See, there's a wilderness, there's a desert. Think, beloved, of the whole reality of, of, of the nuclear threat. Isn't it basically going to turn many places, if not the whole world, into a wilderness? And yet if nations come to see who God is, there's this prospect of a garden, of beauty, a preservation of life. But not only is Egypt a broken reed, in this first point, I just want to bring this one detail before we move on. Assyria is also a broken reed. See, this very man, Rabshakeh, who comes, even though he has a message that is true, it is like a prophet saying, why will you trust Egypt? They are a broken reed. But Rabshakeh, you are also a broken reed. Because you, you read through the passages and, and we see this very man is the one who will commit the most atrocious sin we read in our commentary, in, 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 in the catechism, how great a sin this is, the greatest in essence, because you're actually looking at your very creator and daring to say something against him. He made you, and you will have a word against him? But that's what Rabshakeh does. If you analyze the speech of Rabshakeh, like very Briefly, there are four things, there are four points in his, in his declaration to, to Hezekiah. First, he, he questions the help of other kings, what, what we just saw. He's saying, why are you going to Egypt? Um, they're not going to help you. They're only going to hurt you. And then he, he says that very divine, um, he, he's playing on what he has heard happened in, in Judah, something good. But he's turning it around, hoping that it will affect the people. Let, let me run about that real quickly. When he said, why, why is, are you all going to trust in the Lord? Because isn't Hezekiah the king who told all those high places to be demolished, saying, only worship God here upon this altar. Look what's happening. Reb is thinking like this. There were all those high places. And remember, that, that those high places was not where, where God's people would go and worship false gods. They would go to these high places and burn incense to the one true God. But remember, God had said, I don't want that. I, I don't want everybody going to your high place. I want everybody going to the temple. My, my worship will be centralized, and that's where it will be regulated. That's the one place I chose. But people had that superstition. They thought, oh, I want to burn the incense. I want to go there and do it. So they had these high places. And if you think of it, you would say, well, that's not so bad. It's not idolatry. It is still bad because God never commanded it. And that's where you see the tension that some kings left that alone, even though they would want to fix the temple, but they would leave the high places. And that, if you've read through Kings and Chronicles, you run across this. He was a good king, but he didn't destroy the high places. He was a good king, but he didn't destroy the high places. This was a good king, but he didn't destroy the high places. You get to Hezekiah, it says he reformed the temple and he destroyed the high places. You hear that same general and more pure reformation with Josiah, the other king who was very good and reformed the temple and destroyed the high places. Because these were kings who said, I want to do what is right I'm not going to say, well, because the people are doing it and it's kind of half right, then it's okay. No, if God did not command it, it's wrong. But imagine if you're from the pagan world and you're seeing, wow, they're, they're worshiping Jehovah there and, and, and that king's saying don't. And, and they're Je worshiping Jehovah there and he's saying don't. Worshiping Jehovah there and saying don't. And in their minds, they're not understanding because in their minds, they're, they're very humanly thinking, thinking the more little chapels and the more little temples, the better for that God, that, that God is more popular, that God has more people worshiping. And when he heard that Hezekiah went around toppling all those places, he thought, well, that God's going to get angry. And the, the people are going to get angry. And, and maybe I can use this to make the people now get angry at Hezekiah. And so he said, why are you all trusting the Lord? Your very king has toppled all those high places. Um, that, that's what was happening. 
And you, you can see the malice there because when Hezekiah did that, it was good. But he's turning Hezekiah's good into evil. And then he still in his speech promised rewards. He said it was in a mocking way, I will give you chariots or horses because the people of Judah did not know how to ride horses like in a war because it was so rocky and the terrain was so hard they used mules and not horses. But he says how he would give them horses and then later how he would give them that they could go back to their vines and eat out of their own fig tree. And even when he would say he was being honest, we will take you captive, but we'll give you a land that is good. And he's promising all those things to try to encourage them in essence to to go against their king. And then he says the fourth thing, which was what I call that fatal error. Because when he did this, he wasn't only causing God's people there to pray more earnestly, he was calling God to the battle. In verse 18, he said, Beware lest Hezekiah persuade you, saying, The Lord will deliver us. Hath any of the gods of the nations delivered his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Sepharvaim? And have they delivered Samaria out of my hand? Who are they among all the gods of these lands that have delivered their land out of my hand that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand? His fatal mistake was to equate the living and true Jehovah God of Israel and of the whole world with all the imaginary false gods of all those nations. This, beloved, is where he blasphemed God. He used God's name in vain. It wasn't so bad when he said, your, your very Lord commanded me to come. That, that was, it's amazing how there too you see the slyness. It's true that this is happening under God's providence and sovereignty. But it's obviously not true that he's a servant of that God. But that wasn't yet blasphemy compared to this, what we just read. And so God is now called to the battle. And beloved, this, let this be your encouragement. You know, when, when you are seeing people who are offending and maybe calling you names, or if you feel persecution, don't be troubled. And even the moment that they accuse God himself, Will you remember this and say, now I fear for your life. Don't go there. Don't you dare accuse my God. Because people who have done that have felt the judgment. And I don't want that for you. That should be our heart. We, we should feel the, in the fear. We should feel even we should have tears for the people who would dare go in that direction. And this is what we're learning with this passage. So there are two broken reeds. One is Egypt and one is Assyria. And then secondly, let's go to the living God. In the living God, we, we, we see the, the reality that this, this is... It's Hezekiah who uses this title. So when he hears this threat, you notice what Hezekiah does. He, he immediately sends messengers to Isaiah. Isaiah was their prophet. He was like a pastor to them. And, and they're, they're wanting to pray and they're wanting their pastor to pray. And, and they're just thinking like this. We, we, we don't have an army that could withstand this Assyrian army. We're not going to capitulate. We have been hearing these sermons that we're not supposed to trust kings. So, so notice this, and this is where um, Rabshakeh is, is not being reasonable at all. He's saying, don't trust Egypt. But Rabshakeh is saying, trust me. Trust Sennacherib. But Hezekiah understands, no, I, I can't trust you either. You're also a king. You're also a worldly person who will have no power, but my living God does. So in verse 4 is, is really the, the precious portion of this passage. Um, he, he sends this message to Isaiah. It may be the Lord thy God will hear the words of Rabshakeh. See, he's saying God himself can hear what he said, whom the king of Assyria, his master, hath sent to reproach the living God. 
and will reprove the words which the Lord thy God hath heard. So basically Hezekiah's hope is this. If God heard, and I, I know he does, then God will do what he needs to do because he has the power to do it. But I know that he wants us to pray. So let us summon everyone to pray. And beloved, there's this beauty here. Um, the Assyrian army wants to destabilize Judah. But you don't hear one word. You don't hear the people going to the king saying, let us, let us surrender. We don't want to die. And, and this Eliakim and, and, and this Shebna and this Joah. See, these men, they're not saying to the king, let us listen to those words. No, they're all putting sackcloth. They're all together united thinking what we need to do is go to the Lord. They're, they're responding to all the sermons Isaiah preached. And they're holding on tight to that promise. If we do this, we'll be a garden. If we do this, we'll see a blessing. If we do this, we will see water and not wilderness. And this is exactly what God does. And below, beloved, notice where, where we see the living reality of God. He shows this in prophecy. Um, I don't have time to go through all the details, but it's just astonishing to think of, of all the dimensions of, of, of God's presence in this. Remember when we read there in verse 2 that, that Rebshekah came to this location. He stood by the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the Fuller's Field. That's an exact location. By the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the Fuller's Field. That's 36.2. You know where we hear this exact location before? It's in Isaiah 7. Isaiah goes to Ahaz, who's the father of Hezekiah, who's here. And that's when Isaiah says to Ahaz, Ahaz, stop trusting the nations. You know who Ahaz was trusting to help him? Assyria. The very nation that is now the deadly enemy of Judah. And, and remember he told Ahaz, ask for a sign and God will give you a sign that he will help you. That you don't have to trust the nations. You can trust him. Ask for a sign. And remember Ahaz in his false humility said, I'm not going to put God to the test. And God gives him a sign anyway. And you remember the sign that the virgin would conceive and bear a son. And his name would be called Emmanuel. Well, Ahaz didn't listen to that sermon. He continued trusting man. Ahaz's life is like a desert. He was not a good king. And, and he even prepared Judah to suffer the realities of a wilderness because he was not, of course, a good father to Hezekiah. And yet Hezekiah is here now doing reform. The Lord has saved him. He's a good king. But see, because he was raised by Ahaz he, and because he's human, he's also tempted to trust man. And he's starting to trust Egypt. And, and he has a temptation to trust Rabshakeh. He's probably going through his mind, if, if we surrender, all our people live. If I don't surrender, will, will we turn into a desert where he will come and, and kill us all? So this is hard. Humanly speaking, you can understand the dilemmas of this king, but no, he trusts God, and God shows in his prophecies. See, in the very place where the prophet came to confront a king that did not believe, now there is a Rabshakeh confronting the good king to believe him. So Hezekiah could put this together and say, my father did not believe Isaiah. I am not going to believe Rabshakeh. Let me go to Isaiah. Because the God of Isaiah, who's also my God, is the God that I will listen Isaiah is not coming to me asking for me for a sign, but I will go to Isaiah asking God for a sign. I need God to speak. I will not do what my dad did who didn't want that sign. I want whatever sign he can give me. And so God through prophecy is already showing his presence. And then you could say not only that, but through, through providence. And, and what I mean by providence is in a sense what I already said. This is astonishing. 
Ahaz had been trusting Assyria. Hezekiah knows the history of his own people, especially his own father's times. And Hezekiah could be thinking, the last people I will trust are the people my father trusted. And he was wrong. So God's providence is acting. And then thirdly, we could say God's power. Because God comes. What was the promise to Ahaz, that father? Emmanuel, God with us. And it's like Isaiah understands, not just Isaiah, Hezekiah understands. The promise my father received was that God would be with us. So I will be, I will go to Isaiah who can go to God and I will trust God will come and work. And look, beloved, how God worked. This man, Rebshekah, with his army is there. Hezekiah did not have to command one arrow to go in the direction of that army. There was no plot of preparation of how the battle would go. And it's not that there was disease in the camp. It is not that they were scared of something. They heard a rumor. If, if you go to what happened in chapter 37, verse 7, it says, A rumor. And even when you hear verse one of, of the first phrase of verse 7, Behold, I will send a blast. The word blast is here because of the idea of wind, like a wind blast. So it can be translated even spirit. The, the New King James has a spirit. God is sending a wind. God is sending His spirit. God is sending um, an idea that will go in Rabshakeh's head that he needs to go back. And it came in the form, yes, a message came. He heard of battles being fought, and he thought, I got to go. So, so think of this. Can you imagine turning on the news tomorrow and hearing that a war has ended because a president heard a rumor? We couldn't even believe that that is possible. But that is what God is doing here. His power. He's not even sending angels at this point to fight. It's just a rumor. And you see God's power. He just needs to send a little message that way. And beloved, I, we've seen then the broken reed. We've seen the living God. I, I need to come to the third and last point, the way of holiness. Because, beloved, this is not just for us to go and, and be mesmerized by the history of God's people many, many years ago. How can this be applied to your heart and mind? See, beloved, you and I live in the very same tensions. The world is telling you, don't you hear this message? Believe in man. Believe in yourself. Even be true to yourself. The world has these competing leaders for you to follow, for you to give even everything to, your money, your attention, your time, your favor. And you're supposed to recommend them to so many other people. And if you do that, you're going to be blessed. The world's all about trusting man. But beloved, if you do, your life will be a wilderness. If you don't and you trust God, your life will be a garden. And, and I want to end with that whole picture that Jesus, that God gives when he's describing that garden and the beauty of that garden. He says that there's a highway in verse 8 of chapter 35, and he calls that highway the way of holiness. And I, and I want to just go straight to you to show that this way of holiness, it's, it's not for you to think of, okay, I, I want to get into this way and be holy, 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 hoping that my life will be a garden. It's not in that way. This way of holiness is really a person. God had promised the Father to send Emmanuel, who was Jesus. And we know that when Jesus was here on earth and he was telling his disciples he was going to the Father. They said, um, how do we get there? We don't know the way. And Jesus said, I am the way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus said this in many other ways. In John 10, 7, he said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. Jesus isn't just the way, he's even the entrance into the way. 
And in Matthew 7, 13, he said, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leads unto life, and few there be that find it. You enter the way to this garden of God's grace through the Lord Jesus. And notice, beloved, I, I want to end with this reality, the contrast of the, gar- of the desert and then the garden. We're hearing about this way, and we're hearing Jesus is the way. But this means that Jesus had to suffer all of the effects of the wilderness that you and I, in essence, deserve because of our sins. Have we trusted God all the time? No, we've trusted the power of man. We've trusted sin. We've trusted evil. So we deserve a, guard, uh, we deserve a wilderness. But Jesus went there for us. If you go to that chapter of the wilderness, you could say it was the day of God's sword that bathed in heaven that Jesus felt on the cross. That was chapter 5. It was the sword of the Lord that was filled with blood in verse 6 where Christ suffered the wrath of the Father in heaven. I mean, the Father in heaven, but He was on the cross suffering. And if verse um, 7 of chapter 30, um, chapter 30. Four even speaks of unicorns and, and bullocks. And if you compare that with Psalm 22, where Jesus speaks of all these animals circling him about him, it's these very kinds of animals, bulls of Bashan and unicorns and lions. It was the day of the Lord's vengeance in the year of recompense, verse 8. The cross was that for Jesus. And for Jesus, when he was on the cross, you could say that the streams turned into pitch and the dust into brimstone so much that he cried from the cross, I thirst. It was not quenched day or night. That would be verse 10. It was a complete entire wilderness. You could say the cross for Jesus was a desert that never, ever ended. It was worse than a desert. It was hell. But he endured that hell so that you by faith can enjoy the garden, can enjoy heaven. And when you look at that garden, it is a picture of what Jesus does. Verse 5 of chapter 35, the eyes of the blind shall be opened. And Jesus went about his ministry doing just that. And the ears of the deaf being unstopped. In verse 6, the lame leaped as a heart. In Jesus' ministry, everywhere he walked, it was like he was leaving a trail of garden life. And he would meet a, a woman who had seven spirits, but then we see her just weeping upon the very feet of Jesus, showing and lavishing his love upon her, and you see upon him. And so you see in her life the fruit of forgiveness and the fruit of love and, and of compassion and Christ just watering that garden in the life of, of Mary Magdalene. John's life was turned into a garden. Peter's life was turned into a garden. All the apostles' life was turned into a garden. And and we go into Acts that we're studying through through the Sunday um, afternoons. It's like a trail of garden life. If you believe in Jesus, your life will turn into a garden. And then you will live in a garden forever and ever. And that will be heaven. But for that to happen, Jesus had to suffer a wilderness. May you and I learn with Hezekiah, no matter how dangerous, no matter how many temptations, no matter how much the world woos you to trust in man, remember, they are broken reeds. But God is the living God. And he's given to you, boys and girls. There's an address. It's a way of holiness. And Jesus is the way. God is as if taking us by the hand and saying, come, I'll take you. There's a way. It's my son. Believe in him.
and we will be in heaven forever. And while you live in the wilderness of this world, your life will be a garden here on earth. Amen. Let us pray. Our gracious, glorious God, forgive us, Lord, for all our sins. We, we thank, Lord, of our sins, and those are all the desert realities that we experience, and we do not like them, Lord. We come before Thee and confess our sins, and we ask, Lord, take them all and cleanse us and pardon us, and may there be, Lord, in our lives the, the results like there was for Hezekiah and Isaiah and for Judah that time where it was preserved in a long time of rest and of peace. We pray, Lord, that Thou would bless every family in our congregation, that our lives would flow forth, Lord, what comes forth out of the garden of Christianity, the fruit of the Spirit, love and peace and joy and gladness and goodness and contentment and gratitude. We pray, O Lord, that Thou would Water this garden through thy word, through thy spirit. And those who have not yet entered in through Christ, that they would, that they would see Christ and believe and trust in him and serve him. We pray all these things.